years here, 1325 and 1820, is very important for Nepal because Nepal went through a decade-long armed conflict from 1996 to 2006 and it was the women and girls who were most impacted uh, in terms of they faced uh, all kinds of gender-based violence, including sexual violence. And at this post-conflict and transitional period, they still do not have access to justice, access to support services in terms of counseling, health services. And uh, the other most important thing is, in spite of women being the key agents and having actively advocated for peace even during the time of the conflict, they have not been included, particularly in the decision-making positions, for peace building or all the other mechanisms that have been set up for peace building. So that is the reason when Nepal is moving towards the path of peace building and when all the eyes of the world are watching Nepal, uh, we needed to ensure that uh, the mandate of 1325, which is participation and security of women and girls, be implemented in Nepal as well, particularly uh, that would benefit and those women and girls who have been affected by conflict, one, and the other also it would ensure an en uh, engendered process, a very uh, gendered process of all the planning and processes that takes place for peace building or all the infrastructures and mechanisms that are set up. Because it has uh, specific actions, it has five pillars particularly first one to do with participation. Here we mean to say ensure women's participation in all the peace processes. And then there are specific activities and also indicators. And the other pillar is prevention and protection. The third one is promotion. And the fourth one is relief and recovery. And the fifth one, which is very important, is monitoring and evaluation and resource mobilization, which is a cross-cutting pillar. But the most important thing is all of these pillars have specific action plans and those specific action plans have indicators you know and the indicators are very important to tell us how far what progress we have made and where are the gaps so i believe that having a specific action plan like this will help us to uh, map who's doing what and where we are and what are the gaps and what needs to be strengthened in the second year the development of the National Action Plan on 1325 and 1820 in Nepal was a very collaborative uh, process where uh, the government, civil society and external development partners have been equal stakeholders right from the initial process to the end process where we had the output. Particularly, I say it has been collaborative because we have a high-level steering committee for the implementation of 1325, which has 25 members, out of which 10 members are from the civil society group and then it has representatives from all nine ministries of the government. That's one mechanism. But the other mechanism is while developing the process these members were also involved and the other uh, civil society, the representatives from civil society were given uh, adequate space to voice their concerns and be involved in the planning process. Third, we had a very consultative uh, process because we organized uh, consultations with uh, relevant stakeholders including women directly affected by conflict and girl children in 52 of the 75 districts of Nepal which is covering more than 75 percent of Nepal and uh, these concerns have been reflected you know the, we, we collected more than 1500 action points which were um, uh, reviewed and then prioritized and put under each pillar you know on a priority basis so in that manner right from the initial stage of uh, uh, developing the framework of assessing other countries uh, plans of uh, developing your um, uh, action points uh, of uh, how the consultation needs to be, you know, planning how the consultation needs to take place and also reviewing the feedback that has come from different consultations, prioritizing it and then uh, identifying and refining indicators as well as the responsible organization and supporting organizations. All this has been done in a very collaborative process. So I feel that the National Action Plan development process in Nepal I proudly must say must have been one of the most consulted process, uh, consultative process, you know, globally. It was almost like 
who should be called for a certain consultations, what phrases should be kept, what phrases cannot be kept, what are the existing plans covers the phrases. In every process, we had this collaborative process, you know, with the civil society and the government. And I feel this is very important because tomorrow you need to, this is a plan of action that is owned by the country, you know, and civil society plays a very important role in working with the conflict affected women. And tomorrow, if you don't own the plan, the ownership is so very important. So I think the way the National Action Plan is developed in Nepal, it's not only the civil society in the center who has developed, helped to develop the National Action Plan, but also those community women from different communities and districts who have given their feedback in the plan, have a sense of ownership over the plan. And in that manner, if you have that kind of ownership, I feel that uh, the implementation will be much easier and the end result which will be more beneficial, you know, it will be more impact oriented. So that is why a collaborative process like this uh, is very important. Otherwise, if the government, you know, uh, keeps 10 people and uh, develops a plan, the civil society may not know anything about it, may not own it, and tomorrow you're going to spend time bickering about it, saying we were not consulted, this is not what we want to do, you know, so it might be futile. But in this, at least we have been uh, a part of the entire process. So that way, uh, we hold uh, a lot of accountability you know, and ownership in its uh, meaningful implementation as well. Uh, I think you know, timing is very important because we uh, developed a national action plan when the government had a gender-based violence action plan housed in the Prime Minister's office. A lot of importance was being accorded to gender-based violence. It was the 10th anniversary of 1325. We had a high-level steering committee that was formed for the implementation of 1325. So what is it that your country is looking for? What are the points um, or actions that your country would be interested to pursue that would connect with 1325? I think you need to identify those. And when you have identified those, then have a consultation with the government you know, in terms of how uh, it's going to, the government is also going to benefit and the country is going to benefit by pursuing such a plan. So what are those points that are the buy-ins? You know, that needs to be identified. And the other part is uh, this should not be taken up as a, you know, like a 10-month job or a 15-month job. It really, you really need to have the drive and passion to make sure that you take this to a tangible end, you know, and that's one thing. And it's not a matter of two or three people completing. In, it's also a matter of how you involve the rest of the network, rest of the women's movement in the entire process. So policymakers also need to uh, open up their spaces for civil society, be able to listen to them, you know, acknowledge their work, acknowledge their contribution. And civil society would also say, after all, it is the uh, government partners, it is the policymakers who make plans and, you know, uh, uh, overlook its implementation also. So we need to be partners. We, need, we, we cannot be rivals. We don't benefit out of being rivals. We need to be partners. So how is it that we enhance this partnership? This has to be taken into account by both the civil society as well as the government. And in Nepal, we are improving on that. There's uh, more trust uh, between the government and the civil society now than there was before. And that's because we have better partnership. Advocacy is very important, you know, because the government has many things to do. And if you don't draw the attention or focus of the government on a certain thing which is pertinently needed, I think it's the responsibility of the civil society to draw that attention of the government. So in that time, what is important is time. Like I said, you know, in to, for advocacy to be effective, it's time. So in the context of Nepal, it was a good time. We were going through a post-conflict situation. Women were, uh, you know, had no access to justice, very little women's participation. It was the 10th anniversary. We had a gender-based violence action plan. We had the government's commitment. And the world was watching Nepal. So, you know, timing is very, very important. The other is clear messages. You can't have a civil, one part of the civil society going and saying one thing and the other part of civil society or network saying another thing. So you should have adequate consultations among civil society first and then have a common message, a common advocacy strategy about how we should go about with this. So these are very important things and that's what we worked on in Nepal.